I'm John Lorden, and I've been looking into mysterious occurrences on my YouTube channel since 2015. Joining me today are some friends from Uncovered.com. I'm Rachel Roslett, a forensic psychologist and head of case research and data at Uncovered. I'm Andrea Cipriano. I'm also a forensic psychologist, and I'm a case researcher and content specialist at Uncovered. Welcome back to Lord and Arts Uncovered. And today, we're looking into the unsolved 1991 disappearance of Angela Marie Hammond from Clinton, Missouri. The Hammond family lived in Clinton for three generations, a small farming town with a nine square mile footprint and a population that's never exceeded 9,500 people. The area is known for its great outdoors, excellent boating, fishing, and camping. Despite the apparent natural draw to the town, Wikipedia notes that the town square, the focal point of the Clinton Square Historic District, has been the site of various disasters. Most notably, in 1876, an arsonist burned down multiple buildings in the town square. Unfortunately, Angela's 1991 abduction from the Clinton Town Square can be added to that list. Angela was a 20-year-old woman looking forward to her quickly unfolding life. She had a fiancé that adored her and a baby on the way. However, only four months after her fiancé, Rob, put a ring on Angela's finger, he found himself speeding down the town's roads, chasing after Angela's abductor. The trail on the case went cold until last year when police shared an update, an update that seemingly changes the trajectory of the investigation. Let's turn it over to our case experts to learn more. Rachel, Andrea, what can you tell us about Angela and how does this timeline come together? So Angela was born to her parents, Chris and Marcia, in Kansas City, Missouri on February 9th, 1971. Soon after Angela was born, her parents decided to move the 80 miles south to Clinton, Missouri to be closer to Marcia's parents. Not long after, the family welcomed in a little boy, making Angela a big sister. And growing up, we know that Angela preferred to be called Angie by all of her friends and family. Angie is described as being outgoing, popular, and incredibly smart. At 19 years old, Angie had recently graduated from the local high school, and a previous relationship with a young man named Bill Barker had ended uneventfully. In the fall of 1990, she was taking day classes at Central Missouri State University and working as a bank clerk processor at the local Union State Bank in the evenings. It was also in the fall of 1990 that Angie met and began dating 18-year-old Rob Schaefer. Rob was a local football star who was also very likable and smart. Uh, they had met while they were at school. Rob's athleticism was working in his favor as he planned to join the military that following year. While still in school, Rob was also working odd jobs to make money for the time being. Then, in January of 1991, Angie finds out that she was pregnant. She shares the news with Rob, and he couldn't be more excited. Not long after, Rob gathers up all of the money that he can from his odd jobs, he buys an engagement ring, and gets down on one knee to propose to Angie. She says yes. Rob later recalls when he's talking with the Unsolved Mysteries producers that when he proposed to Angie, he promised to always take care of her. Now, I just want to stop there for a second because actions certainly speak louder than words. And we're talking about very young people. You know, Rob mm -hmm. could have had a different reaction when she came around and said, oh, I'm pregnant. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear because we have a ring that's purchased. We have him get down on one knee. I'm sure there's family members that can say, yes, we knew they were engaged. Yes, we saw the ring. So um, I know a lot of you out there are probably, you know, we're starting to look at kind of the, I hate calling it a cast of characters, but whenever we look at cases like this, people do start making a catalog in their head of like, okay, all the people that are part of this case. Uh, just, I would just want to point out from the start here, Rob seems to be on board with the pregnancy. Um, Maybe there's a little wrinkle we're going to touch on that could have changed his perspective on that or something, but uh, we're, we're going to be looking at a lot of information that comes from Rob, so I just kind of wanted to, to touch on that. Um, Agreed. Yeah, go ahead and continue. Mm -hmm. The spring of 1991 is, trans is a transformative time for the young couple. On February 9th, 1991, Angie's friends and family helped her celebrate her 20th birthday. Soon after, Rob and Angie began renting a trailer home and they moved in together. Rob has shared that during that time, money was definitely tight, but they had each other and that's what mattered. So this brings us to Thursday, April 4th of 1991. 
In the afternoon, Angie and Rob are at Angela's mother's home on the 1600 block of Southwest Road 370. They're there for a family barbecue. And the two of them stay until about nine o'clock at night until Angie drives Rob over to his parents' house on the 700 block of South Main Street. And they get there at about 10 o'clock at night. Rob agreed to watch his younger brother until his mom could come home from work. And the plan was that after Rob's mom came back from work, the two would go back to Angie's mom's house and stay for the night. To pass the time while Rob was babysitting, Angie picks up her best friend, Kyla, and the two drive around town just chattering that there's no record of them stopping or going anywhere. Just before 11 p.m., Angie drops Kyla back off at her house. And at this point, Angie is tired from an incredibly social day, so she stops at a payphone to call Rob. It's important to note that the payphone that she stops at is in the center of the town, and it's really only about seven blocks away from Rob's family's home. few things important to note there, because, yeah, we've got a lot of questions, to be honest with you guys, about this phone call. Like, why stop from there? Um, it sounds like that phone call is verified, that there certainly was a phone call that happened from that payphone to the house where Rob's family lived. But we do have another point of verification here in that Kyla got dropped off at her house. Kyla, I'm sure, spoke to the investigators, so we can get a confirmation that, yes, she actually did go out with Angie that night. Uh, it's saying they drove around for an hour, which I know when I was that age, I kind of would do from occasion to occasion. Just get a friend, hang out in the car, or just go kind of cruising you know, mm -hmm, for, for yep. the evening. Um, is there another aspect to what's going on in that hour? We don't know that this is we're just giving you guys the kind of official information that we're getting. But big questions on this. Look, Robin and Angie, only seven blocks away from each other. Why is she stopping at this phone? One of the things I'm thinking about is the possibility that she was already at a pay phone for some reason. Who knows what that could mean? But it just seems strange that from seven blocks away, like, you know, why don't you're, you're in a car? Why don't you just go back to where he is and then you can have this conversation face to face, especially if the plan is you're going back to where he is anyway, which mm -hmm. is what is seemingly discussed. So it's kind of tricky to understand, but let's go ahead and bring up a map so you guys get a little sense of part of, of why we're getting tripped up on this a little bit. So here's the map at uncovered.com and the payphone is here at the corner of Jefferson and it's showing 13 uh, but this is second street i guess it's also highway 13. Uh, this red mark here is where rob schaefer's family home is so you can see i mean it's literally a straight shot six or seven blocks and she would have been there but mm -hmm. for some reason that's not what happened she called from this payphone they had a conversation about what they were going to do that night um part of that conversation is that she wants to change plans and not go back to her mother's house, which her mother lives way out here. And mm -hmm. according to the timeline that you guys laid out is about an hour's drive. So, you know, this phone call is happening around 11 o'clock at night. She's saying, I don't want to drive an hour back out to my mom's house. Plus there is another location we don't have on this map. And that is the trailer that Rob and Angie live in. Um, basically you guys couldn't identify what trailer park it was, right? Yeah, there's essentially three different trailer parks that we could find in the Clinton area. And no, we couldn't find any information that details which one they would have been in. Okay, yeah. And who knows? I mean, it could be that they're not even in Clinton proper. There's a lot mm -hmm. of kind of smaller communities around this. Um, mm -hmm. So, but one way or another, they're talking about the fact they're not going to drive back out to her mother's house. All right. Yeah, um, I think, it, I mean, I grew up in a small town driving around town for an hour was something that's all you had to do, right? That was entertainment. Yeah. So I definitely get that. The part I get hung up on though is if she's so tired, why not just drive finish the drive back to Rob? Why stop and make a phone call? Mm -hmm. That's why theoretically. I'm yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, just thinking like theoretically, Angie could have driven the seven blocks back to Rob's parents' house and they could have just crashed there for the night. There didn't have to be any additional driving. And we also learned that part of why she would have been using a payphone just in general is that there is no home phone connected to the trailer home that the two of them shared. So that could be part of why using a, a payphone is part of their own, you know, the way that they communicate. 
But in this case, at this time, where they both are, and the fact that Angie was just in the car the whole time, she has her car, driving the seven blocks wouldn't be out of the ordinary. There's another mm -hmm. possibility I want to throw in here. We have no information to support this at all, but I'm just thinking about what I did when I was a kid, what a lot of young kids would do. If you're going out for an hour like that, uh, is there some possibility maybe that you might smoke a little marijuana, get a little high for some reason? All of a sudden, if you add that component to this story, some things start to make a little more sense, like the phone call, the, oh, I'm not going to be driving. We're not going to do that hour drive back to my mom's. Like maybe she's starting to feel like, you know, the effects are starting to take hold and she's not going to be in shape to do that or something along those lines. There's just, for me, this is the first of several pieces of this story where there seems to be a gap. I don't feel like we're getting quite all the detail of, of what's going on here. So I think we just got to remain open to um, those possibilities as well. Because if you don't, you're stuck with this question about why are you making a phone call from seven blocks away? Mm -hmm. And that's going to make Rob look a lot more suspicious in all this, to, to be perfectly honest. But um, yeah. so what happens on the phone call? We've talked about this, this phone call and the logistics of it. What's actually said on this phone call? Mm -hmm. So the payphone records indicate that Angie calls Rob at 11.15 p.m. And in his interview with Unsolved Mysteries a year later, Rob recalls that Angie sounded pretty tired and said that she didn't want to drive back to her mom's house and that she just wanted to drive back to their shared home. And Rob said that he was fine with that. And they hung on the line together to chat for a bit before she went home. While they were talking, Angie suddenly tells Rob that she keeps seeing an old green truck that was circling the block. Rob said something to the effect of, quote, they're probably just lost. Angie wasn't concerned until the truck, the truck drove into the parking lot and pulls right up next to the phone booth that she's at. The driver of the green truck gets out and goes to the phone booth right next to Angie. But he's only there for a brief moment and then he goes back to his truck. And Rob recalls that this is around the time that Angie was starting to feel unsettled by this man. And she describes to Rob over the phone that he was a white man with a filthy beard and mustache, wearing a baseball cap, glasses, and overalls. Angie also starts to describe to Rob that he's pulled out a flashlight, and then he's starting to rummage through his car, apparently looking for something. Uh, kind of scary thinking about the possibilities of what he could be looking for. And my brain is just... I'm so split right now in terms of trying to process this story that we're hearing and for some reason i'm I'm having trouble with believability like uh, like they discuss the plans for the night but then she stays there and they kind of chit chat for a while i would like to know like what the length of the phone call was i don't i don't think yeah. you guys have bumped into that information obviously but um and then even with this like oh okay, hey there's a truck that keeps circling around you know, I, if it was my loved one on the phone, I might be like, okay, get in your car and get out. Like, just leave the situation. I'm seven blocks away. You know, get home. Mm -hmm. Like, why are we even having this phone call? Like, that, that's where I'd be going with it. But for all this activity they're describing, circling a bunch of times, pulling up next to her, he comes up to literally the phone right next to hers, goes back to his vehicle. Now he's looking for something. There's an aspect I'm struggling with in terms of it sounds like I feel like I'm being fed a story. Mm -hmm. I feel like the details are just like, because I know what to, I already know what to expect here. And yes, of course, we've, we've talked about this case. We've researched this case. We already know where this goes, but even outside of that, if you're looking at these facts and taking this just as a story that's coming to you, what do you guys think is going to happen next? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he, all mm -hmm. of a sudden this creepy guy that pulls up, starts looking in his vehicle for something. Yeah, while it's not evidence of guilt, it, it feels like there are some decisions being made here that are very counterintuitive to what you think would, you know, happen. I'm tired. I'm not going to stop and use the payphone when I could have just been home by that time. Yeah. Um, and then to hang out and, and we'll learn more in a minute, but then to hang out and do more when there's a creepy guy around just doesn't seem logical what makes a whole lot more sense here is if there was a disagreement if her and rob had an argument that night she drove off to go talk to a friend to cool down mm -hmm. about it she's calling home before she goes there to make sure that things are cool or to try mm -hmm. to defuse the situation like all of a sudden in that lens a lot of these actions these steps start to make more sense but that's not the story that we're being told here um mm -hmm. which yeah 
I'm struggling with, but please uh, go ahead and continue. Where's, where does this go, Rachel? Yeah. So this is another interesting piece to that story. So at Rob's request, Angie asked the man if he needs to use the phone in case the other phone was broken. Apparently the man responds, quote, no, I'll try again in a minute. It wasn't too long after that, that Rob says Angie, Angie suddenly shrieked into the phone and Rob heard a man's voice say, quote, I didn't need to use the phone anyway. Rob told Unsolved Mysteries, quote, the only thing that went through my mind was getting up there and finding out what the hell was going on. I just dropped the phone and ran out of the house. I didn't hang the phone back up and just headed there. There's a lot to unpack there. You know, I think the first thing that I really pick up on is that while this is happening, Rob says that he can hear this man say, I don't need to use the phone anyway. And for me, it's just it's something that's really interesting because in that same moment, he's also hearing his fiance scream into the phone. And well, and what does her screaming stop like, you, mm -hmm. you know, for for that audio to even come through like that? And then once again, just this this nagging feeling I have about like, oh, someone's telling me a story like someone's we yarn spinning a yarn like now we're hearing from the suspect. I didn't need, you know, like a storyteller is trying to tell me, give me a clear intent of what this character's motivations are. Like, I didn't need that part, that sentence. Uh, it's yeah. I'm just, I'm sorry, guys. I'm really, it's really, odd. I'm, I'm, I'm just struggling. And it could just be, cause I, I do know people like this. Some people are natural storytellers mm -hmm. and things like that will just happen in their stories, even for true occurrences that, that they're talking about. Um, or it could be the perspective of what Rob is going through and he believes he heard something like that and he's convinced himself now that, oh yes, I, I for certain heard that. So mm -hmm. I, I do see both sides of it, but, um, yeah, the, I don't know, this, this, these details are, are a little troubling, um, a little hard to swallow, I guess is, is the best way that I can take it. Mm -hmm. So what happens, Andrea? So it's at this point that Rob was driving towards the payphone a few blocks away when he says that he sees a green pickup truck speed past him in the other direction. He says that he saw a woman in the passenger seat hanging over trying to get to the driver's side and yelling Robbie out of the window. I'm, I'm curious why he would say it was a woman. I mean, we're, we're having such descriptions like this uh, and having someone hanging out and yelling his name like and knowing that you're going out there to to find her, I just I'm I'm curious about that part of the description. But mm -hmm. I, it, if you're the woman in the truck being abducted, I, you know, if she would have had to recognize him and the car he was driving, which presumably isn't theirs because she has their car, right? So she recognizes him in an unknown car, and she's. Mm. screaming Robbie out the window, you know, it, it kind of the, the details that he is sharing are, um, elaborate. They're very, you know, kind of out there. And he's also not sharing at the same time details that would link all these pieces to the, of the story together. And, and I, that's where we just keep getting tripped up on this one. I, I think we have to jump ahead in this, this story a little bit and just say that he's not a person of interest. Mm -hmm, he, mm -hmm. he is not a suspect in this case. Um, mm -hmm. but he was cleared within the first week. Yeah. Yep. So uh, with, even with that being said, like there's a lot of these elements, first of all, just the logistics of an abduction like this. Are we talking that there was multiple people that were involved in this abduction? Because he's not giving us any detail like that. So we're assuming that she was somehow not subdued in mm -hmm. the passenger cab of a driving vehicle enough to be screaming for Robbie as she sees him going by, but she's not fighting to get out of that situation in any way with a single person that's responsible for trying to drive the vehicle while taking care of their abductee. Mm -hmm. Trouble. Like the logic, mm -hmm. the logic is just... It's not super solid. Mm -hmm. So uh, Rob immediately stopped his car. He says he threw it in reverse and he spun around to chase after the pickup truck. 
In the moment, he says he didn't realize that the violent jerking of his car severely damaged the transmission. He says he chased the green pickup truck for roughly two miles down the main street until the pickup truck took a sharp right turn and he tried to follow. The sharp right turn blew out his transmission, he claims, and his car sputtered to a stop. Rob says he then gets out and tries to chase after the truck on foot, but fails. He told Unsolved Mysteries, quote, all I saw was his brake lights and dust. So uh, I don't think any of us are car experts here. Um, the, the situation that I'm thinking of between shifting like that, you know, being in uh, drive and then throwing it into reverse hard and fast, I know that you could damage your drivetrain. I think that would be an immediate break. I don't think you'd be able to move after that. Um, it sounds like the story he's saying is this somehow damaged his transmission. I don't know if that meant that, you know, a casing cracked and like fluid was leaking or something like that. If any of you out there are experts in this area, please drop a comment down below and give us some insight into this aspect of the story. Is this part of the story believable? Does the two miles kind of make sense before the truck would come to an halt? Uh, does the leaning into the turn, the sharp right turn, actually damage the transmission even further. Um, I'd really like some of your kind of more expert opinions on that. So please tell us in the comments down below. Uh, we're going to take a look at a map of the chase route as it's been described by Rob. And let's go ahead and bring that up now. Uh, Andrea, you want to kind of talk us through this? I know we got the payphone up here at the top. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So for context, we can see the top, which is the location of the payphone. And the red line is the driving direction and just the the overall chase route that Rob describes to police and also to Unsolved Mysteries. And so they're going south along this main ride or this main road. And then it's that sharp right at the very bottom that Rob says is where the pickup truck just totally sped off. And it's that right where he says that his car eventually breaks down. We don't know where he stops along that bottom line, but depending on, you know, the story that he says, it's it's apparently not too long after the the turn. Okay. So in in an act of um, bizarre chance, from the abduction point, they happen to go in the direction of where Rob's family home is. So the feasibility of him actually jumping into a vehicle, he's only about a block off of that street. He goes out to that same street that way, meets up with the vehicle somewhere around here, throws it in reverse, turns around and does all this. It's possible. It's possible. Um, there's something interesting about this path, though, and about that turn in particular. And we'll just bring up another map to kind of show this real quick. So here's Second Street. Here's Jefferson. Here's where the phone call happens. The chase goes down Second Street, uh, also Highway 13 here. If you continue on that, Highway 13 actually turns into a road that leads right to, it looks like a boat ramp. <laughs> wow. So um, he wouldn't have had anywhere to go, basically. He, he would run right into the water. If what Rob is saying is true, uh, this person would probably be someone that's familiar with this area. And we're talking about not a giant population, right? You know, less than 10,000 people. Um, probably knew that this road was going to run out and then decided to turn this way. But quite honestly, for a getaway, even that's not the best decision because if he would have cut a left instead, he could have got out to the main highways here and been off and heading for a different state if that was the plan. Uh, going west, the direction that he did, he kind of throws himself back into just neighborhood sections and a lot of it's closed off. There's only a few roads that actually lead out of this area. This isn't even a road. This here is a train track. Um, mm -hmm. So pretty interesting. I mean, there is, there's one road outside of getting back up to 18. There's only one road in this area that would get him out of there. So it's interesting to me that from an investigative standpoint, they wouldn't have looked at that and said, you know, we got to look at people in this particular quarter of the town. Because for mm -hmm. some reason, this person knew, I can't stay on this road. They turned this direction away from the highways to get really get out of there. Um, yeah, in a town this small, um, you know, if you're a stranger, you're going to want to get out of town fast. Because strange people, strange cars are noticed. And to turn back in towards town 
yeah. you know, back in towards the neighborhood makes me wonder that or makes me think that this person really wasn't worried about seeming to appear out of place. And this situation, based on the story we're getting from Rob, this really sounds like a crime of opportunity situation that mm -hmm. someone was driving by, saw this young pretty girl on a phone, decided to stop and take advantage of the situation. Like that's really the makeup of the story that I feel like we're being told by Rob. Um, yes. And the logistics of, you know, she's out driving around with a friend. Like how, how much are you going to be able to lean into this was someone that was following her, you know, mm -hmm. through this whole day. Like we know that they were at a barbecue an hour away for most of the day before this. They're stopping at the family's residence, not their own residence, so that Rob can watch his brother. Um, it'd be, I think it'd be a little bit different if, you know, yeah, they were at their home all day, the actual place where they lived. They didn't do anything else. And then she goes out at this time of night. Then you could theorize, well, yeah, someone was watching the house. They saw that she left. They followed and, and it picked up from there seems like a crime of opportunity based on the details we're getting from Rob. But, so what happens next? So we're around midnight at this point in our timeline and Rob knows that running after this pickup truck is essentially fruitless. So he runs back in the direction of town and flags down a passing car. Eventually a car does stop and drives Rob directly to the police station. At first, the investigators have a hard time believing Rob's story, and they say it's essentially a story right out of a movie. And their tune starts to change a little bit when they do discover Rob's car, where he said it would be, and in the damaged condition that he did describe. Mm -hmm. So the Clinton City Police Department only has one detective on staff in 1991. Mm. They take Rob's full statement and launch a full search for the truck and the man, they also draw up a composite composite sketch of the offender based on the description that Angie gave Rob. Now, I'm glad you brought up the composite sketch. Uh, first of all, just the logistics of trying to draw up a composite sketch based on a secondhand account because she's seeing the person, describing the person to Rob, and now Rob is talking to a forensic artist about how to take that information and turn it into something useful. I think that whole approach personally, probably not very strong. Um, but what's even more curious about that, let's go ahead and bring up the sketch. Uh, you guys heard the description that we read to you. Does this even look like the description that we heard? Well, it's and missing. again, yeah, it's missing all those key <laughs> details. Like everything. Yes. So but again, uh, Rob didn't see the person. So how do we know that the shape of the mouth and the nose and the eyes are correct uh, or the hair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does, how does the sketch come out this way? What, what happened for them to, to draw this kind of sketch? It certainly couldn't be based off of, I mean, I hope it's not based off of, um, just what Angie told Rob, because there's no way. No, yeah. beard, glasses, hat, right. I mean, all the identifiable characteristics that were conveyed in the phone call are missing. So right. what mm -hmm. exactly is this? The only thing I could hope is that I know that there was some other people that said they thought they saw someone acting mysterious in this area. Perhaps this is a composite based off their descriptions, maybe. Mm -hmm. But even then, linking that to the actual occurrence like if, if that is how this information came in, I would be saying, well, they didn't see the same guy. Mm -hmm. And I would pretty right. much be saying, you know what, this, their, you know, eyewitness information is not solid because they're not describing what she saw. And especially if they saw it at the time, because who, I guess there is an assumption that he could have been in a disguise and that's why they made the composite without those items, without the beard, without the, the glasses and the cap. But if you had eyewitnesses from that time, he would have been in the disguise. He still would have been wearing the same stuff. So either their information, their information certainly shouldn't supersede the victim's point of view in terms of what he looked like. Somehow Correct. we wind up with this composite sketch, which is already in a case that's very hard to understand is just another twist where I'm, it's got me shaking my head going like, what's going on with this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and as you said, they, go ahead. Sorry. Um, and as you said too, John, the idea of this being a disguise, the, the police did say, I, I, don't, I don't know who would have actually asked them, whether it was Rob or the family or whoever, 
But they did, the police did say that they omitted the facial hair and the glasses because they felt that it was a disguise. To that point, though, I don't know that that was their decision to make, especially since we already have a description that Rob and Angie gave in this case. And we've seen law enforcement officials put out, you know, multiple sketches, one with disguises, they what they presume to be a disguise and one without. And I, I think it's important to include both, because if someone witnessed the abduction, they saw the suspect in that disguise. They didn't see the suspect as it is right now on the screen. That's a good point. That's a good point. And honestly, I might be. I think a stronger thing, especially because you have Rob seeing the vehicle, at least mm -hmm. I would be putting out some, okay, this is the type of model vehicle. This is the color that Rob saw. We have this description of the artwork. Rob was supposedly behind the vehicle. Uh, I don't know if this is, you know, for a while there, especially like 60s, 70s, they had like full on window decals that would take up the whole back window. So if it's one of those, like give us a good description of that. Give us an artist rendering of mm -hmm. what Rob remembers him chasing, which should be, I mean, he's saying that he saw the victim in the vehicle. Like that information is so much stronger than we're going to try to do a composite sketch based and then we're going to remove all the key factors that were told to us. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, this well, is really curious. It's interesting, too, because this is the 90s, and we're talking about a Ford pickup truck that's from the 1960s. That's There has to be few, only a few of those around. It's going mm -hmm. to be a very distinctive-looking truck. It feels like that should have been easily identifiable. You would have to assume it's, it's registered. Possibly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know in some parts of this country, you can get away with driving a vehicle that, that isn't necessarily registered, but it would have been recently registered. Like, look at the past 20 years. Um, yeah, Ford, 1960s model. Like, I would think they could narrow it down. And then especially considering this this looks like it's someone local. I mean, if, if that turn mm -hmm. is accurate, there's someone that they know this area. Um, so what happens? What happens with the investigation? Obviously, mm -hmm. we're not feeling super strong about the composite sketch, but what else do they well, do the, around this? <laughs> the good news is, is that the state police and the FBI are brought in almost immediately. Uh, they continue to search for Angie on both private and public properties. Rob um, starts off as a person of interest in the investigation, but they seemingly can't corroborate, corroborate much of his story. Uh, until two other witnesses later come forward and say they also saw a truck and a suspicious person around the local payphones before Angie disappeared. Uh, Rob also takes a polygraph test. He passes it. And so he's cleared of suspicion within a week of Angie's disappearance. Angie's family is, is also adamant that they don't think Rob would have ever um, even wished harm to his fiance. And as the investigation goes on without much movement, the small town rumors begin and they say that Angie's ex-boyfriend, Bill Barker, was possibly involved. And the rumors detail that Angie was pregnant with Bill's child and not Rob's, which would seemingly give Bill motive. And ultimately, that rumor is squashed when Bill takes the polygraph test, he passes. And ultimately, there's no evidence that ever comes to light to support this theory. That could also actually give Rob motive. Yes. It could be that Rob didn't know about that. That information comes out and, you know, now this whole kind of idea I have, like, what if there was an actual dispute that happened that day might have some form of, of bearing. Uh, and of course, we know many of you out there uh, have looked into information on polygraph tests and, and a lot of us have very big doubts about validity and especially using it for completely ruling someone out like this. Um, even to the point of, hey, the investigators went and they found his truck and it was, you know, the transmission was damaged like he described. Okay, um, you know, could it be that this vehicle was already practically incapacitated at his parents' home and he drove it out there for two miles to leave it in that spot before he went running around, got someone's attention? Like, that's, it's kind of easy to stage something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but you've got this time frame, right? Because we know that she gets dropped off by her friend. We do have a phone call that's been cataloged. Um, it, it seems like a pretty tight time frame for something like that, but oh goodness. Um, so it sounds like Rob 
is officially at least cleared of being a suspect. So is this ex-boyfriend. And we have investigators back at square one, probably with that big consideration that we have to crime of opportunity, possibly. And uh, this is a good time to bring up that on Angie's case visualization on Uncovered, they've listed two other possibly connected cases. So let's go ahead and touch on those real quick. Mm -hmm. So investigators start to look at possible connections to two other unsolved cases within a hundred mile radius. So four months earlier in January of 1991, Trudy Darby, a 41-year-old convenience store worker, is abducted from the store. Her murder body was found two days later. And then one month later, 30-year-old Cheryl Kenny, another convenience store worker, vanishes in the parking lot after she locks up. She's also believed to have been kidnapped. Serial killer Kenneth McDuff was also on a killing spree in the general area from 1966 to 1992. And he was also originally looked at as a suspect, but he was never officially linked to Angie's case. And after Angie's case was featured in Unsolved Mysteries in 1992, not many leads were generated and Angie's case went cold. That is until 2021. Last year, on the 30th anniversary of Angie's disappearance, police shared an update that changes the trajectory of the investigators' theories. A press conference held by the Clinton Police Department detailed that an informant had come forward and said Angie's abduction may have been a case of mistaken identity. While this seems a little far-fetched, Captain Paul Abbott said it's a very likely scenario. So what can you ladies share with us about this unfolding update? in another bizarre twist with this case. The investigators currently working on the case have shared that in 1991, a man was working in the area as a confidential informant for a high profile narcotics case. This man played a key role in significantly disrupting the illegal narcotics operations by testifying in a court proceeding. When this man's identity became known to the criminals, the informant then received a letter in the mail made out of magazine clippings. It's really a chilling piece of evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it absolutely is. The letter was postmarked on April 4th, 1991, which is the exact date that Angie was abducted. And the letter mentions the correct court number and the man's estranged wife by her first name. Investigators then learned that the man's wife and daughter, a daughter whose name was also Angela, they were living in Clinton, Missouri at the time, just like Angie Hammond. So we do have a picture of this note here, and uh, we can see some of it's been redacted. Uh, obviously, he was calling this person out by their court-assigned number. That's where we can see this redaction on top. Uh, for this reading, I'm just going to put four in there. So... Hello, number four, we know who you are, number four. People like you deserve what you get. We know where your foxy daughter is at. She will see us soon. Tell blank, we're assuming number four's wife. She has our deepest sympathy in her further loss. Goodbye, four. Certainly chilling. Um, I, I don't know about, you know, kind of connecting this back to the case. It's interesting to me that, yeah, it's postmarked on the same day, but also this text is being written from the perspective of this kidnapping has not happened yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then combine that with the fact that we have Angie kind of being random, at least according to Rob at this point, she's out driving with a friend. And we know that they had several stops that day, like we talked about previously, probably not a kind of typical day for them. So is this person, I mean, is this someone that's been tailing them that literally was sitting across from her mother's house while they're at a barbecue for several hours, follows them an hour away, watch, watches Rob get dropped off at his family, watches her go and pick up her friend. I just, it's a lot, it's a lot of tracking, like to, to take this possibility and, and really put it in consideration. I'm struggling mm -hmm. with it. What What do you ladies think? Uh, personally, I think the note um, was meant to be a scare tactic. If you're going to call, if you're going to kill somebody, you're not going to tell them that you're going to do it first. Uh, send them a note and tell them to be on watch because I'm going to come kill you. They mm -hmm. would just do it and then send the note afterward to say, hey, we're the ones that did it because you testified in court. So I think, you know, the note was m meant to be scary, 
um, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't fit with her abduction. Um, and then, you know, it, these notes, we see them, but they're usually done in, you know, by people who don't really do the crime. It's something to divert attention. I, you know, I a can, lot of these turn I'm out sure. to be hoaxes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm hmm. Yep. That's something that I think about, too. Top of mind that oftentimes ransom notes are just distractions. And thinking again, the idea that if this is somebody who was stalking Angie to try to find this Angela character, this person, the problem is in a small town, you would think if she's driving around with her friend, she would see in her rearview mirror this whole time, this old green truck. Right, and she doesn't right. say anything on the phone. It's not until she's in the parking lot that this car even comes up. How would that person have found her if this wasn't a part of her routine? It yeah. just brings up more questions, honestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, I mean, all that changes if, oh, this was a normal school day. She went to the college. She went to her job after. On her way home, she stopped and used a phone. Like this, this possibility certainly gets elevated at that point. But Rachel, it looks like law enforcement is considering it for some reason. Can you give us a little more insight into why mm -hmm. they're feeling so strong about it? Yeah. Once the police sort of chased down um, and went through this rabbit hole, they discovered that the informant's daughter, Angela, looks strikingly similar to Angie Hammond. This then sparked the mistaken identity theory. It's important to note that the investigators have been looking at this angle since the 1990s. But a recent anonymous telephone call to the Clinton Police Department has helped this evidence become public. Hmm. So, you know, a couple of interesting connecting pieces there, but just the, uh, I don't know, the randomness of Angie's actions. I'm, I'm having trouble thinking that she was being followed like mm -hmm. that. And especially mm -hmm. at that time, like, you know, nowadays, you know, could someone theoretically put a tracker on your car or have some kind of app installed on your phone that you don't know about or something? Yes. Like that kind of stuff is, is possible nowadays. Back then, a little different. So the case is at a point where investigators could benefit from the public's help. Dive in for yourself at uncovered.com's page for this case. The address is on your screen, and we also have a link in the description box below. There you can see all of our sources. We were able to find nearly 150 sources of media coverage for Angie's case. And of those, we have 50 original newspaper articles from the 1990s listed that detail the original investigation as it was happening. And you can also see the full timeline on Angie's page, as well as view an image of the ransom note. Mm -hmm. This case really needs more exposure, though, so please share this video and our page at Uncovered with any friends or family that you have in Missouri. And of course, the biggest help is if you know something, say something, especially if you have any information on someone that matches the description Rob and other witnesses have given on this individual or information about that truck in question. For good measure, again, the description of the suspect Angie gave to Rob is a man who was dirty looking, with a full mustache and beard. The suspect also had on glasses and was wearing overalls. The truck in question is an older model two-tone green truck with a white top. It was described as a late 1960s Ford pickup truck with a water or fish scene decal pasted in the back window. You could submit tips to the Clinton Police Department by calling 660-885-5561. If you need to remain anonymous for any reason, please contact Crime Stoppers at 512-472-8477 or by using the Crime Stoppers app. Thank you to the Clinton Police Department, Unsolved Mysteries, KY3 News, The Daily Mail, 921 News, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, the Doe Network, the Charlie Project, the Kansas City Star, KIX Radio, the Springfield News Leader, Trace Evidence Podcast, Where Are They Podcast, the Mystery Box Blog, Inside Edition, Newspapers.com, Web Sleuths, Reddit, and Wikipedia. Also, a very big thank you to my friends at Uncovered.com and co-hosts on today's show, Rachel Rosalette and Andrea Cipriano. Please join us again in two weeks as we look into another mystery that deserves to be uncovered. <laughs>